Good evening, everyone. This is Les Smith. I'm with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar uh, for the Spartan Chemical Superfund site uh, informational session. Uh, before we get to this evening's first speaker, I would like to inform you of a couple of uh, items. Uh, specifically, first, that all of your um, lines are muted right now, which means that you should hopefully hear me, um, but we won't be able to hear you. Um, and also want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to view it um, um, in a day or so following um, this evening's conversation. With re in terms of being able to communicate with us this evening, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items for you. Um, as we have our, um, before our panelists joins us this evening, I want to talk about how you can um, communicate with us. There's three ways. Um, if you um, are on Zoom um, watching with us, uh, you can use the question and answer box located at the bottom of the uh, screen for Zoom. Um, you can type in your questions and we'll uh, read those out, out later on at, uh, during the question and answer session. Uh, the section, second option is to raise your hand electronically. There's a hand icon at the bottom of the screen that you can um, choose to raise your hand and we'll see that and we'll um, unmute your mics later um, to ask a question of this evening's panelists. And uh, the last option, and we do have at least one person on the phone joining us who is um, in listen only. Um, if you are on the phone, um, you can select star and a number nine to electronically raise your hand, letting us know that you would like to ask a question to this, this evening's panelists, and we'll unmute your mic. Um, don't worry if you didn't catch all of that. Uh, we will um, readdress the uh, ability to ask questions again following this evening's presentation. Um, we do have a number of attendees that are um, joining us this evening and still have people joining. And um, looks like it's kind of the numbers have stabilized at the moment. So uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Melissa Powers Taylor, who is with the with Eagles Remediation and Redevelopment Division, who will give us a presentation about the Spartan Chemical Site. Uh, take it away, Melissa. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, like Les said, my name is Melissa Powers Taylor, and I am the project manager for the Spartan Chemical Superfund site in Wyoming. And tonight we're going to be talking about the um, Spartan Chemical Superfund site remedial excavation pilot study that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks here. Um, and we'd like to provide you all with an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the site, some of the site history, um, some recent activities that have been going on, and then what we have coming up in the future. So we'd like to introduce you to our project team. So from the state side at Eagle, um, I'm the project manager for the site and Matt Baltusis is our technical support senior geologist. And we are teamed up with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services with Jake Carrick, the toxicologist, and also with the US Environmental Protection Agency. And Stephanie Ross is the remedial project manager for the Spartan Chemical Site. And for this upcoming excavation project, um, we're working with several contractors. Wood Environmental and Infrastructure is our environmental consulting company. And we have a excavation contractor who will be doing the work and their subcontractor. So our excavation contractor is STE Group and their subcontractor for the remediation is Clean Harbors Environmental Services. So the agenda for tonight's meeting, we're gonna be going over some site history, um, the background of the 2015 excavation attempt for the soil at the site, what's planned for our 2020 excavation, what some of the next steps are for remediation at the site, and then we'll allow some time to answer any of your questions that you have. So just to sum up why we are all here tonight, we'll be talking about um, the WHO, Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or EGLE, um, the what, we're going to be doing a soil excavation pilot study. 
um, when. It's going to cover a time frame of about mid-October through sometime in um, mid to late December, possibly through the beginning of January. Where is the Spartan Chemical Superfund site in Wyoming? And we'll show you where that's at in just a minute. And the why. So we're going to be testing three different gas suppression technologies, and I'll talk to you about what that means in a little bit, to determine which works the best. The best one will be used for a full-scale excavation uh, planned for 2022 to remove even more contaminated soil at the site. So the Spartan Chemical Superfund site is located um, in Wyoming on 28th Street. Well, the address is on 28th Street. However, access by public road to the site is only available off of Thornwood Street. So the general area we're talking about is Byron Center Road, uh, or Byron Center Avenue Southwest and 28th Street uh, near Kent Door um, and Potter House High School. The Spartan Chemical Company operated from 1952 until 1992 as a bulk chemical transfer, blending, and repackaging plant. There were many above ground and below ground storage tanks on site that would store various chemicals. Spartan Chemical would direct mix these chemicals into the trucks um, from the storage tanks for delivery to their clients. Known chemical spills occurred between 1963 and 1990 at the site. In 1983, the Spartan Chemical site was added to the national priorities list and became what was commonly known as a Superfund site. In 1984, Spartan Chemical agreed to investigate the contaminant, the contamination at the site. A common question we get at Eagle is, what is a Superfund site and how is it different from other sites that have contamination? Well, a Superfund site is a property where pollution exists in potentially soil, surface water, sediment, and or groundwater, but also meets certain criteria that qualifies it to be added to what's called the national priorities list. These sites are often complex and require and, and can require various types of remediation. The Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, which is commonly known as Superfund, gives the Environmental Protection Agency the funds and authority to remediate contaminated sites when the polluter is not able to clean up the site themselves. This can be because they are not viable financially um, or they're no longer in existence. EPA can share this authority with the states who can investigate and remediate the sites on their behalf. The state is currently investigating and remediating the Spartan Chemical site as the lead agency and using federal grant funds and state match funds to do so. In 1992, Spartan Chemical declared bankruptcy and in 1993, the state of Michigan took over the investigation and remediation at the site. So fast forward from 1993 to 2015, um, in between that time frame, various investigation and remediation took place, uh, which led to the 2015 soil excavation project. This project planned to remove soil from several areas known to have high amounts of contamination, where the formal chemical operations took place on the southern half of the property. So in this figure, there's a few areas highlighted um, in blue and green, and those areas were planned for excavation. During the excavation in 2015, however, discolored soils were found during concrete removal that were not seen during previous investigations. Volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, were detected in the air on site above target levels set for the project. So you can see in the photos, um, there are uh, discolorations. I think it's easiest to see in the photo to the right where you can kind of see some blue on one of, the, one of the rocks there. So 
So what is a VOC? There are many different kinds of contaminants that we regulate, investigate, and remediate at Eagle. One of them are known as volatile organic compounds, which is abbreviated VOCs. These compounds, which are found in soil at the Spartan chemical site, can evaporate into the air. In certain quantities, they can be harmful if they are inhaled. They are commonly used in industrial settings for purposes like degreasing and as solvents and can be used in commercial settings for dry cleaning, um, things such as clothing. During the 2015 excavation, when the soil was disturbed, the VOCs began to evaporate to the air and were detected in on-site air monitoring equipment by Eagle's contractors. Target levels of VOCs were set for that project when on-site air monitoring equipment detected concentrations of VOCs that exceeded those levels, work was stopped. A cover was placed over the excavation area to prevent contaminated air from leaving the site. And a new plan of action was developed to allow for safe removal of soils from the site. So that starts to bring us to where we are today. Between 2016 and 2020, Eagle and our contractor collected additional data and used that data to design a pilot study to test three different technologies to control the VOCs from leaving the soil at the site. Our excavation contractors um, have been hired and they will begin set up for the excavation at the site in the next couple of weeks. Um, our, the digging at the site is planned to begin in mid-October. So um, now we'll talk about some of the details regarding the 2020 remedial excavation pilot study. Um, one of the biggest concerns that residents in the past have had is the trucking route. So Thornwood Street, in addition to having industrial um, and commercial businesses on it is also a residential street. So um, we will have increased trucking traffic that will be leaving um, the Spartan chemical site and then coming onto the Spartan chemical site uh, from Thornwood Street and then also on Byron Center Avenue. Unfortunately, um, this is the only um, public access route to and from the site. Heavy machinery hours will be limited to 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. The excavation duration is going to last between, um, is expected to last between October and December 2020, um, but final regrading and seeding will take place in spring of 21 after the final thaw after winter. So to get into a little bit more of the details of what we plan on doing, um, a pilot study is a small scale on-site test to determine if a technology will work for the conditions at our site. So we have selected three technologies that have been used in similar settings to control VOCs from leaving soils at elevated levels and we plan to test them in three small areas on site to make sure that they work well on our specific soils before we begin the full scale remediation on the, um, on the majority of the southern half of the site. So this figure uh, shows four areas on the site where Eagle knows VOCs and metal contaminations exist. The two areas that are circled in yellow um, will be used to test a VOC suppressing foam. One area um, will be used to test a VOC surfactant and that area is um, outlined in an orange triangle, or I'm sorry, an orange rectangle. Um, and then one area will be um, enclosed under a very large tent and soil excavation will be conducted under the tent and the air will be treated with a carbon filter system. And that area is under the green triangle. 
Um, the foam and the surfactant do not contain per or polyfluoral alkyl substances, which are also known as PFAS. Um, the area that's outlined in the orange rectangle at the bottom right hand of the map does extend about 10 feet onto the soccer fields of the Potter's House High School. This excavation area will be about seven to eight feet deep and the digging on the school's property is anticipated to take less than one day. The area will be backfilled with clean sand after the targeted area has been uh, removed. The area will be separated from the schoolyard by an eight foot tall chain link construction fence with a privacy screen. Um, that fence will extend out about 30 feet east into the school's um, yard, the, the soccer yard, uh, beyond the boundary of the excavation. So there's going to be a buffer zone between the excavation area and the um, soccer field. So how will Eagle know how much VOCs are leaving the site? Air monitoring will take place with, um, air monitoring will take place daily while active excavation work is occurring. This includes between the school and the excavation areas uh, multiple times per day. Results are gonna be analyzed on site with laboratory grade equipment. In addition, to the surfactant and foam being applied to the soil to keep the VOCs from leaving the excavation. A misting perimeter system will be set up around the perimeter of the active, active excavation area and will be used as a second line of defense to suppress the VOCs. We will, be also, we will also be monitoring the air with handheld um, equipment known as a um, PID, photoionization detector, which can um, read volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere. So how does EAGLE know what levels of each chemical are safe for workers on site and the community to breathe? Well, EAGLE has toxicologists that develop site-specific criteria based on the best available data. On-site workers collect samples throughout the day and analyze them within an hour of the collection time. The results are compared to site-specific data. Now I'd like to bring in Jacob Carrick from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to help us learn a little bit more about how our agencies develop screening levels for chemicals and how we use them. So welcome, Jacob. Hi. Let's see. All right, you can switch to the next slide. <clears throat> and click. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how these screen levels or the criteria that Melissa just mentioned, how those are developed and used. So first, um, or toxicologists will review the scientific literature and see what information is available or on the toxicity of a particular chemical. Click. They'll identify certain key studies that will serve as a basis for the screening level. And they focus on um, the studies that have the most reliable information and that are most relevant to human health. Click. So oftentimes those key studies will be animal studies or studies of people who are exposed to very high levels in the workplace. So it's necessary to kind of translate that information into a screening level that's applicable to the general population. Um, that process of translating that information into a screening level, there's some uncertainty that goes along with that. And that uncertainty is taken into account in the calculation of the screening level. So essentially the screening levels are de deliberately made much lower to ensure that they are protective of the most sensitive people. Click. So those screen levels are then used to evaluate exposures out in the real world. For example, like the criteria that are gonna be used at the Spartan chemical site. And then 
our understanding of these chemicals is constantly evolving. So as new science comes out, we're continually updating those screening levels. And next. Okay, so this green arrow you can see as kind of the, the level of contamination in the air. And this bar at the bottom is, you can see as the screen level, which is kind of a graphic to help you visualize it. So if the concentration in the air is below the screen level, we have high confidence that it doesn't pre present a real health risk. If the concentration is above the screen level, it means that there's a need to reduce exposure or do some other kind of action. And it says that the contamination could pose a health hazard. It does not necessarily mean that someone exposed to that level would experience health effects. Okay, so I touched on in the last slide a little bit about how there's some, there can be some uncertainty about the exact dividing line between an acceptable and unacceptable exposure and how that is taken into account in the screening level. So these, these levels have kind of a built-in buffer or kind of cushion to them. So the main message here is that a screening level is not the level at which a health effect will occur. That wouldn't be especially useful to us and it wouldn't be very protective because we want to be alerted to an issue well before it becomes an immediate health hazard. So rather a screening level is uh, kind of an, an early warning signal that some action needs to be taken. So, and finally, um, whether or not someone experiences health effects from an exposure depends on a number of factors. So things like the level and duration of exposure or how long you're exposed. And duration is an important one to keep in mind. So as, a, as an, just an example, if you think of filling up your gas tank at the gas station, you could breathe in some benzene from the gasoline, but because it's such a short time, that doesn't present a real significant health hazard. But if you were exposed to that same level over several years or a lifetime, it could become a legitimate health hazard. So it's important to think about both the level you're exposed to and how long. Some other factors that can affect this are individual sensitivity, genetics, whether you have any existing health conditions, um, lifestyle choices, things like smoking, as well as any other exposure you might have in your daily life. So that's just a little overview about what, what the, a screening level or um, ambient air criteria means. And I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Jacob. Jacob will be available at the end of the presentation to help answer any questions you may have. Based on the available information we have now, what is the immediate risk to the nearby community? Current data does not show immediate risk to the community due to the soil removal at the site. We will monitor ambient air to ensure that a risk does not develop over time. We are taking precautions based on what we've learned from the last excavation to ensure that a risk does not develop. And these precautions are designed to protect both on-site workers and the community. So what's gonna happen if an air sample concentration, or if the concentration in an air sample exceeds one of our site-specific criteria for the Spartan Chemicals site? Um, in the areas with foam or surfactant, the amount of foam or surfactant will be increased until the air concentration is below the site-specific criteria. That's one of the things that we're testing is um, how much it'll take to um, bring it below a certain level. And then in the tented area, the perimeter misting system will be turned on and continue to run until the air concentration is below the site-specific criteria. If the air concentration cannot be lowered below the site-specific criteria, what will happen then? The, um, the area will be covered with a protective barrier and the excavation activities will stop. Air monitoring will continue until 
um, in the air to ensure that the protective cover has stopped to the VOCs from leaving the soil. So that gives you an overview of what we plan to do for this upcoming project that's going to start um, in a couple of weeks. And then just to give you an idea of um, some of the things that we have coming up over the next few years and then looking on into the future. Um, in 2021, we're going to take the data that we collect from this pilot study and use that to plan for the full scale remediation. And then in 2022, we plan to perform the full scale um, soil remediation at the site, which will cover the southern half of the site where the um, old uh, plant property and um, above ground and below ground storage tanks used to exist. And then between 2020 and 2026, we're going to collect additional groundwater data and then perform the planned groundwater remediation for the site. And um, I put my contact information up on the screen and Jacob Carrick's contact information up on the screen. And now we have some time to take any questions that anybody may have. All right, thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Jacob. Um, before we get into the question and answer session, I want to give uh, folks some time uh, to process what they just heard and think about their questions that they will have for you and Jacob and maybe some of our other um, panelists that we have behind the scenes. Uh, but I did want to introduce one other person um, that's helping me this evening, and that's Mr. Jim Ostrowski, who was helping me navigate questions this evening. And so I do apologize for that. Um, we do have um, a couple of ways to um, ask questions this evening. Uh, you may type a question in the Q&A box in Zoom at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you may electronically raise your hand, select the icon that is also at the bottom of the screen. And we did have at least one individual on the phone. Um, I think, uh, no, we have no one on the phone right now, but um, if uh, we do have any um, callers um, join in by listen only mode, um, they could hit star nine. So um, with that said, uh, Jacob, if you could uh, turn your camera on and your microphone on and join us here on the screen. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in and um, for our attendees, um, don't be shy um, to ask questions. So we're here to um, answer your questions this evening. The first question uh, that I have here um, concerns the screening levels. Can you please identify the actual screening level for the VLCs identified at the site? What were the actual VLC levels during the last soil removal? I'll start with those because there's a couple more after that. So there's multiple that we're monitoring for. Um, several of the compounds we're monitoring for are trichloroethylene, um, benzene, tetrachloroethylene. Um, I don't have the screening levels pulled up in front of me. Um, but if you can leave your email address in the um, in the chat box, or if you can email me, my information's on the screen, I can get those to the question asker. Okay, and your contact information is still on the screen yep. uh, there for you. Uh, okay, excellent. All right, so there's a couple more questions related to this request. Um, the next question is, what is the target VLC that's a volatile organic compound emission for the three trials scheduled for this fall. So that's again about what the what the VOC screening levels are. Mm -hmm. Mike or Justin, do you have those handy? I do have them pulled up, or I have the work plan pulled up. I'm not sure if you want me to just say those or. Yeah, you can right say them. I mean, yeah, of the of the main compounds of concern. Yeah, yeah. It looks like there's eight chemicals that had site specific criteria, or that are shown in this table here. Yeah, you can read those, Jacob. Um, so one 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 trichloroethane has a site specific acceptable air criteria of. 916 parts per billion. 
trichloroethylene is 0 0.4, tetrachloroethylene 6, benzene 10.6, toluene 4,500, ethyl benzene 203, total xylenes 170, and 124 trimethyl benzene 41. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, the next question, uh, same requester, uh, will you just go with the lowest or is there a, a numerical target that needs to be met in order to consider it okay to proceed? It sounds like they're asking what is our action level here? Justin, I'm gonna kick that question over to you. If you wanna unmute. And Les, can you read that one one more time? Sure. Um, the question is, will, will Eagle just go with the lowest number, or is there a numerical target that needs to be met in order to be considered okay to proceed? I can, uh, I can definitely answer that. I'm trying to turn my video on, and it's not working, though. Sorry. Um, but... Uh, the, the number that we're using is um, based on uh, residential acceptor air concentrations for ambient air uh, for six months of exposure, the numbers that Jacob just read off. So we're, we're looking at those and we're making decisions based on that data and uh, whether the, the sampling we're taking routinely is below or above those numbers. And, uh, and uh, and, and even though the, they're based on six months, we're acting uh, immediately based on whether or not they're above or below those numbers. Uh, thank you, Justin. Hey, Justin, uh, for, the, for our attendees, if you wouldn't mind, could you just um, identify yourself and who you work for and what's your role in this um, investigation? Sure, and sorry again that my video decided not to work. My name is Justin Gal. I'm an engineer with Wood Environmental Infrastructure. I am supporting EGLE and, um, and the EPA on this project to um, identify the, the technologies to be used and specifying the design for the project. Thank you, Justin. Sure. Uh, next question. Um, this next question is, what are the names of the foam products and the surfactant products to keep the VLCs from escaping the soil? I, I can answer that again if you'd like. Yep, go ahead, Justin. So the foam products that we specified is called a uh, Rusmar foam. There's a suite of them based on how long they they last, how long they re retain their vapor suppression uh, longevity. Um, so I won't list off uh, the suite of them, but it's, it's Rusmar foams. The, there, are, there is one other potential option that we haven't, we, we may evaluate called older armor, but um, right now we're specifying Rusmar foams as the, as the one we're planning on using. And the surfactant is called Biosolve Pink Water. All right, thank you, Justin. Sure. I, okay, I have a couple of questions here. One is more like a comment, so we'll um, I'll come back to that one. Um, question is, what year did Eagle start the investigation on the site? Uh, did you say 1983? No. Um, 1983 was the year that the site was added to the national priorities list. Um, the site was still owned and operated by Spartan Chemical Company at that time. Um, Spartan Chemical Company agreed to start investigating the site in 1984. They were operating a groundwater pump and treat system from 1984 until I believe 
1992. Um, and then in 1993, Eagle took over the investigation at the site. Um, remediation activities started at the site, I believe in, oh, I'm gonna phone a friend, Mike McGowan. Mike McGowan is the project manager for our consultant, Wood, um, and has been working on this project for many years. Mike, um, what year did we start doing remedial activities? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, uh, Wood got on board back in 2010. If you recall, the record of decision was 2007. And before that, um, I think it was Weston that did a lot of the investigation in the early 2000s um, that, that led to the creation of the record of decision. So once the record, so the record of decision is a document that um, follows a remedial investigation. So once the remedial investigation is done, um, typically the normal Superfund process is there's a remedial investigation and then there's a feasibility study. Um, and then there's a record of decision which rem uh, memorializes what the remedy at the site is gonna be. And uh, once the record of decision was in place, the state started doing some of the remedial actions and during one of the remedial actions in 2015, um, that's when we discovered those discolored soils that weren't identified in previous investigations. So um, we had to do <clears throat> what's called an explanation of significant difference um, and do a slight remedy change. Um, and the Superfund process is a long process. Typically Superfund sites take longer to clean up um, than other sites. Because this site doesn't have a viable responsible party, um, we are dependent on either state or federal funding to clean up the site and to um, investigate the site. So, we are very fortunate with this site that um, the EPA is able to give us grant funding um, to, to do the remedial actions that we're currently doing. Um, so we're able to do these now um, at a fairly rapid pace, um, but that, that isn't necessarily how it always goes. So it has been a long process, um, but we are starting to pick up the pace. Um, investigations of contaminated sites can take a very long time. Um, and Superfund sites in particular are very complex and uh, take a long time to fully understand the, what we call a conceptual site model so that we make sure that we are putting in place the, the correct remedy so that um, we're cleaning up the site efficiently. But yes, 37 years is a long time. Okay. Um, I don't have any new questions in the box um, right now, but you know, we have some time here. Uh, if there's uh, anyone still has questions, uh, about the investigation, about the pilot study uh, that will be conducted here starting here in a few days. Um, I, um, Melissa, let's talk about um, how we're gonna keep the community updated while we're waiting for questions. Sure. Um, I know we're talking about, I'm, uh, as not only am I your meeting host this evening, I am also the liaison to the Remediation Redevelopment Division. I do work with uh, Melissa and several of her colleagues here. So uh, we are developing a, a website for this, um, for this project where we will be populating it with information about uh, the investigation and per periodic updates. Um, about what's happening with the pilot study work um, going forward. 
So um, stay tuned for that. We will have an announcement uh, when that website is stood up uh, so that uh, it'll be available to the public to, um, to read and to keep an update um, on what's happening at the site. And we also set up the, um, the gov delivery. Yes. Yes, uh, we have developed a, a create a gov delivery uh, list for the Spartan chemical site, which we will also announce as well. Um, you will have the opportunity uh, to sign up for that gov delivery list. So all announcements that we, we Eagle um, announce about the Spartan chemical site, that's the list that we will use primarily. Um, so feel free to, uh, once we get that out to you, um, we'll, those who want to be um, notified, we can uh, get your contact information here and uh, send out a notice um, when that um, gov delivery that gov delivery list is uh, ready. It should be just a day or so. And following uh, this public meeting, um, probably about a year from now, um, after we select our technology to use for the full-scale remediation. Um, we'll hold another public meeting to inform the community on, on the, uh, which technology we're gonna use and then the plan for the full-scale remediation. Okay. It looks like we got a new thank you, Thanks, Melissa. I have a new question. Um, have the VLC plumes for PERC and TCE been delineated? Have those plumes been defined? So limited groundwater sampling has been done in the past. Um, most recently we sampled um, the monitoring wells that still exist on site in the middle of September um, to start that process back up. Um, it, it does not appear that the plumes are mobile, um, and we are in the process of confirming that. So um, there is TCE and other contaminants in groundwater, and we do have remedies selected for those and for a few hot spots, including um, in situ chemical oxidation, um, air sparge, soil vapor extraction, and um, we're working on a work plan to, to do some further delineation of where the TCE and other contaminants are located. We just want to refine our plume map. Thank you. And our plan is to sample those semi-annually. Um, through 2022, um, and then we're going to refine our uh, groundwater remedy design. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the attendees would like to know if we will send a notice of the website to the attendees. Yes, um, we should be able to um, get the contact information for those that have registered for this event. Um, we'll use that as a starting point. Um, for building that um, that mailing list, the Gov delivery list, and then um, we will use that to announce the website as well. So there was an excellent follow-up question that just came into something I said, and I'm sorry. I am a um, hydrogeologist by training, and sometimes I can get a little too technical. Um, so, what does it mean to say a plume is mobile? Um, if a if groundwater uh, if contamination in, a, in groundwater is not moving that means that it's um, staying in one place and um, it's it's not moving down gradient or if you think like a river it's not moving downstream um, if it's mobile that means that the plume is potentially expanding um, and it's moving down gradient so if you're thinking like a river, it would be like the plume was um, flowing down river, um, but in groundwater, it's underground. So that's what it means to be mobile. It means it's moving. Thank you, Melissa. So in this, 
In this case, sure. it doesn't appear to be moving. All right, it is presently 646 and don't have any new questions. I don't have any hands raised at the moment. Um, Melissa or Jacob, uh, do you have any, oh wait, wait one more, I'm sorry. Uh, what about the VLC plume in the soil below the groundwater? So we have soil, so we have the soil and then below the unsaturated soil, um, we have soil that's saturated with groundwater. Um, so we don't have soil below the groundwater that's unsaturated. Um, So the, the VOC plume that's in the groundwater is also in soil. So the, the groundwater flows through soil. So the, the VOC plume will also flow through the soil. All right. Um, any final thoughts? Uh... Any final comments uh, to share with our attendees? We have, we had about 23 on this evening. Uh, we still have 17 with us. Uh, any final thoughts to share? Melissa, no? Sorry, I, I was just pondering <laughs> that last question a little bit further. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the commenter, or the, the person who asked the question had a follow up. Um, I, I understand okay. the, the follow-up. Um, hey, let's talk about the follow-up because no one knows what the follow-up is. The, the follow-up question is, or the, the comment is, uh, TCA will travel below groundwater. That's, that's, I guess that's the, the question. Will TCE travel below the, the groundwater? So TCE will sink in groundwater. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily float on the top of the groundwater and move. It can, it can sink and move down. Um, and with the, with the topography, with, with the topography of the clay layer that's under um, the sand at the site, um, there are areas where we have uh, VOCs that are sitting in, um, sitting in undulating clay. Um, if this person wants to send me an email or call me, we can have a conversation about it. Sure. Um, be here to, to talk with some maps. Yeah, uh, thanks, Melissa. I've actually included your, um, your email address and telephone number in the chat uh, for our attendees that are still with us. Um, I have also included the 800 number for the Department of Health and Human, no, that's the Department of Health and Human Services. It's um, for Eagles, um, um, environmental assistance center so um, and jake's telephone number and email address is also available on the screen um melissa do you have any final thoughts i really appreciate everyone tuning in tonight for this virtual public meeting um i think it's really important for the community to uh, know what's going on about the contamination um that is in the community nearby. So if anyone does have any questions or concerns, um, you want to know more about the site, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we'd love to help you know more. So thank you very much for, for tuning in. All right, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Justin and Mike for uh, uh, assisting with the panelists uh, tonight. Uh, thank you all to each of you uh, for taking the time out of your evening to um, hear about this important project that is going on in the city of Wyoming. Again, this meeting, it has been recorded and will be made available in a few days. It will, will be posted to Eagle's YouTube uh, video channel, and please stay tuned for that. And with that, that will conclude this evening's webinar, and you all have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>